Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of On the Mic with Mike. I am your host, Mike Larkin, and joining me today is professional wrestler and a very talented professional wrestler at that, Miss Alice Inc. Alice, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, first and foremost, it's a pleasure and a privilege. You're doing a lot of great things, whether it be in the UK, whether it be Denmark, all around Europe, doing the thing. You're one of the most international talents that I really do have a great fondness of. And I got to say, you're taking the world by storm over there. Well, I'm trying to, piece by piece. I mean, uh, I um, I always had this aspiration. I just um, I came into pro wrestling a bit different than a lot of other people. I uh, wasn't actually following it so much uh, or at all uh, growing up. But um, since I stepped into ring, my aspirations always been I'm I want to be as good as I can be, and obviously getting to go to different places, work with different people is um, is making that process a lot easier. So I'm very very blessed to be able to do that. That's a, that's the thing, man. I mean, life is a blessing. I think with each and every passing day, we always learn something new, and I think that's the great thing about the professional wrestling industry. You never stop learning. So I think I look at it as a plus, and there's a lot of positivity to go with that mindset. So I adhere to that one thousand percent. Awesome. <laughs> No, I, I get it. And I think for me, like loving professional wrestling, the art form that it is and seeing people and women like yourself, it, it's always amazing like to tell the story of how people get into professional wrestling. And you actually find that a lot nowadays. Like some people don't follow it, then boom, it's right into their lives, right? There's so many outlets now, whether it be reality, television, a lot of things from pop culture that equate to how people get into professional wrestling. So for you as someone, you didn't follow it, boom. How did that come into fruition with professional wrestling? How did it like kind of fall into your lap? We're going to get into your martial arts stuff as well, because my goodness gracious, woman, those strikes, those kicks, <laughs> models. But let's talk about the professional wrestling side of things first. Like, how did you just like, boom, here I am. I'm a professional wrestler. Right. So um, I went to a few live shows with actually a martial arts friend. Um, we've been training ages before that, but um, we'll get into that later, obviously. Uh, no, but we went to a few live shows and thought, oh, that looks that looks cool. And we had a great time. Didn't think much of it. I, wrestling was not exactly a thing on TV in Sweden at all. Um, you had to have special networks. And um, my parents didn't really think that was worth it. So I did not grow up watching it at all. Um, it didn't see, it, you never saw anything about it in the papers. Which is, it just wasn't a thing. Uh, but I always had a love for uh, for the martial arts and like stunts in movies and so it's it's kind of similar and I seeing it live was obviously it's such a good live experience. I don't think you ever get like the same feelings and the same the same experience with anything else because there's so many different things compacted into one uh, when it comes to wrestling. But um, I didn't think I was ever gonna be a wrestler. That was not in the ballpark. But um, she called me up uh, quite a while after uh, after we went to the shows because we did that for a while and that was fun, but nothing more happened. And then she called me up. You know, you can you can actually try out to be a wrestler. Uh, would you want to come with me? Because I want to go. And I didn't actually understand what the word tryout in this meant. I thought you you went there and you you tested it for a few hours. And I, oh, okay, this could be a fun experience to do. I, I always I, I love pushing myself and trying new stuff. So it sounded it sound like a great day basically. Uh, I get there and the first thing they tell me, I have to sign this uh, waiver in case of injury. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, it's going to be a five uh, five hour tryout. So and we're going to have, um, this, this is basically an addition. So we'll see if you, you, if you make the cut. I was like, oh, this wasn't exactly what I agreed to do today. <laughs> I had no idea how long this was going to be. I, I just, I I just went there with an open mind, but second I stepped into the ring and we started like doing the drills and, you know, love at first bump. What can I say? And this, I just wanted to do this. Uh, and fortunately for me, it worked out and I, I made the cut. So, um, and we had a half, half a year term for, uh, for basic training at first with the, with the intent of doing your first show after like a kid's show, not a proper show, but a kid's show after half a year. So, um, that was the first goal, and it's just been rolling on from that. Which, first and foremost, I got to say, you're going like, okay, it's going to be a trap. Then here's this five-hour, oh, by the way, here's the non-waiver. I look at it from a stance, too, as well, when we see that a lot in the States. And I think for me, like, where I grew up, I grew up on Long Island, New York. Like, the NYWC, the New York Wrestling Connection, which gave us talents like Brian Myers, Matt Cardona, Kurt Hawkins, and Zach Wright, and so many people that went on to different wrestling auspices. When you have that wrestling school, and I know you can attest to this, 
Finding the right wrestling school is so important in professional wrestling. Finding that grace, like you said, love at first bump. Finding your fluidity and your overall crispness in the ring. Just having that proper training is so important, not just in wrestling, but in any sport. And I think it's a lot of things that really needs to be focused on even more in today's society with a lot of the new generation that's getting in to professional wrestling. That's very true. And I mean, obviously in the States, you have so many different schools and uh, it's a very different scene than it is in the Nordics. Um, here it's more of a novelty. It's very few people actually doing this. Uh, I had um, I had a great timing because uh, the tryout I was at was the first proper tryout in my region or in my city. Um, otherwise, it's taken in people for trainings a bit more uh, on and off. Um, people come, people go. Uh, this was the first proper tryout where we had a group that actually had the same kind of progress. Obviously, a lot of people dropped out. I'm not going to lie. It's uh, not for everyone. It shouldn't be for everyone either, I think. it's it, it does take a certain mindset to do wrestling. I do believe that. Uh, but we actually were a group that followed, and, and we made it uh, at least half of us to the half-year mark. And uh, we all, all of us are actually still doing this in some format. Um, in different shows so um, but that hasn't been um, this it's very tough with training venues specifically in Stockholm where I'm from it's a uh, it's a very expensive city to to have um, to have venues and just in general it's very expensive to put up shows uh, so it's um, I'm very happy that I got that first half year and got like at least the first the first introduction to wrestling that way in a condensed way and actually proper proper basic training because that has not been the case always. And I'm, I'm, all, I'm very glad that I was a part of that group specifically. I got to say, and I think one of the best things is, is it gave us the career that you have now and a lot of people get to see you. And I look at it from a stance too as well. Speaking on the American side of things, I love the whole international side of things, whether it be Sweden and Finland, which we'll get to Regina Rosendahl in a second. But my God, it's such an influx of talent. And we get to see a lot of us as Americans enhance our repertoires with some European maneuvers, such as an uppercut, if you will. But it's great to have that nice balance in professional wrestling, whether it's from here in the States to international side, from international side to here it just makes for a lot of great vast majority in professional wrestling and it makes for a nice mix because again we get to travel more and a lot of people it's a bucket list to go either to the states or to international so you're really owning your craft and applying it even more it's wonderful to see oh thank you as well i think it's um i'm very happy to be on this journey right now uh, i did not see this uh five years ago but I'm here now and I'm going to make the most out of it. And I'm, I'm definitely, I'm looking to the, hopefully make it to the U.S. fairly soon for a little bit of a tour. Fingers crossed that's possible because flight prices and everything. Uh, but it is something I'm looking into. Japan would obviously be also like new ground to break that I would love to go there. Uh, probably, I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to be booked as a super heel due to the tattoos, but that's that's fine. <laughs> That's also a new challenge to master. Uh, but yeah, there's so, so many interesting scenes in the world. And the world is, um, we're very lucky the way the way life is. And I just hope it can continue like this, obviously, with um, the situation right now in Europe. Uh, it's, not, it's not as great as I would hope it would be. Um, but I'm hoping things will get back to normality soon and we can all just this is all is everyone is people uh, and wrestlers is, is now um, as well i mean the exchange you're talking about wrestlers from different uh, countries and different uh, parts of the world we're all just wrestlers it doesn't matter we all want the same thing we just want to be good at this and we just want to just want to hear the crowd and want to have fun and i think that's a common denominator it doesn't matter where you're from and that's why it works Oh, agreed. And in today's society, and what I love about professional wrestling is that equality factor, if you will. Like you said, it doesn't matter what wrestlers are, man, female. There's a lot of individuals from the LGBT community getting into it. I think what's wonderful about that is, too, and we get that diversity in professional wrestling because we get more people added to it. And I think having more schools, having more talent in it, I think is wonderful. And I think for you, and I'm going to say this once more, we're talking about Sweden, we're talking about everything international side. For the Japan side of things, that's another bucket list for everybody. The strong style, and I got to say, again, Madon, those kicks, those strikes, you would fit in like a hand-in-glove, ma'am. So, I mean, it goes into it, and you nope. were talking. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, I'm just saying, from, like, 
face and heel side of things as well. Like you talk about that heel factor. I think whatever how you apply your craft and from seeing your work, you could be a big baby face, that white meat baby face, so to speak, or that intense heel. I think you can nail it both down pat. And like you said, with the tattoos, it gives you that edge. And I'm going to say, Miss Alice Inc., you got that gravitational pull sort of towards you because a lot of people, they see that edge. It works, man. That's what I'm I'm hoping, but I'm just trying to be, I mean, I'm always trying to be me. And when I'm, when I'm Alice, I'm, uh, I'm me just turn up 500%. Uh, so, um, and it's, it's always, I think everyone has that badass uh, person within them as well. Just bring it out. Okay, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to, the, the mindset when I go into the ring is the same mindset I have when I've had like um, martial arts fights, like proper um, tournaments and stuff. But I have the same mindset. I, I always walk into the ring to win. It doesn't matter if it's wrestling. I go in there to win, regardless of what the plan might be. But the mindset has to be right because that's that's the that's what it is. That's uh, that's what I'm portraying in this. If I don't believe it, why would anyone else? That's the beauty thing about professional wrestling, and I'm going to say for those who are non-wrestling fans and you tell them wrestling is about storytelling, they look at you like you got three heads, and I'm like, you don't understand. Like the mechanics and the science of holding on a lock and really showcasing that pain, that evoking emotions, that's what, make the story, that's what makes the story, you know what I'm saying? The perfect baby face, the protagonist, the perfect heel, the antagonist. It's like a story, it's like a book, and what you're doing is you're applying your, your canvas right in the ring there. So it's one of those things where it's like, if you have a good story, if you have something that could hook an invest people boom you're in and that's what's really wonderful about professional wrestling that's completely right it's all about the story and um yeah this i mean the thing is everything is about stories you i think humanity is built on stories and wrestling is just uh it's, it's another way to entertain by the medium of stories uh, so is uh anime and so is movies and uh, all of this it's the same kind of basic concepts like repeated in different ways but humanity is drawn to it that's why it works all over the world as well agreed and i what i love about it too is as well and we'll, we'll talk about this miss storyteller here because let me tell you something about your stories they do have a violent ending because again we're going to talk about martial arts here no and i mean this with the utmost sincerity and respect i love the tie-in of mixed martial arts and martial arts as a whole with professional wrestling. And I think that nice little flavor, F-L-A-V-A, I'm talking about flavor, Miss Alice Thing. You bring that when it comes to your style. So I'm going to talk about this. Martial arts. Kick strikes, you're molly whopping people. There's a U.S. term I'm teaching <laughs> now, molly whop. You're molly whopping people. You're just going in there. You're disciplined. You have that crispness and fluidity that I mentioned earlier on. But let's talk about getting into martial arts here, man, because how did that come into fruition for you? You have so many different crafts and so many different arts and so much discipline. And I, I have smiles just talking about it. How did you get involved in the world of martial arts? What made you want to do that? I mean, I started with martial arts uh, quite early in life. Um, I was quite a young teenager. Um, and I've, I've done different type of disciplines. I, I actually started um, as a young teenager with Aikido, which is very different to what, I, um, what I've done since. But that was a good basis, I think, for a lot of other things. I learned, like, uh, I learned to fall properly. I learned to take care of my body. I learned like the, um, the fluidity of things, which I can use in other martial arts to come. Uh, but I, I got into it first. Um, I, I, was, I was a bit... I don't, I don't think I was an easy child, <laughs> uh, but I have a lot of older cousins uh, and one of them basically took my ear and said, you're going to do martial arts because that's going to be good for you. <laughs> and uh, he was absolutely right. So I, I, I started with Aikido, then I went on to uh, boxing, like regular um, Western boxing for a while. Uh, did that and had a lot of fun with it. I also did Iaido, uh, the sword um, technician. Uh, uh, kind of thing for a while, which is um, fascinating. I did not have the temperament for it at the time. <laughs> uh, it's too too many too many small details and very very. He's he's so good at this. I mean, I had a trainer that was um, uh, what's the name? Uh, metric matricious. Um, hmm. Yeah, uh, which I maybe was not. <laughs> At, uh, at my in my early um, not even in my twenties I think I was still like in teenage years by that time but yeah uh, he shouted at me and I shouted back and but we had a lot of fun in between <laughs> uh, but um, 
did that boxing. I tried out. I tried some other stuff as well for like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for a short while, and uh, I went through a lot of different martial arts for a short period of time, trying them out. And then I um, also again my my cousin um, telling me, okay, you should go to this school because you've bounced around a lot now. You tried stuff out. This is what you should be doing. And I ended up at. Um, a school that is uh, localized in, in Stockholm uh, with a system that incorporates both uh, jiu-jitsu, um, karate and kickboxing, uh, but also with a lot of self-defense um, elements in it. And um, I've been there for uh, for 10 plus years and um, that's also that's been my martial arts basis. That's where I actually started taking it, not just for learning the things, but actually started to engulf myself in the culture around it as well with, uh, with the grading systems and stuff, which I always had a problem with. I do not like taking belt tests, but <laughs> eventually I figured out, well, okay, that is actually a good way to to progress in this as well, like having those goals and, and, and structure it around that, even if it's not my main goal. My main goal has always been like, okay, I want to be, I, I want to have the um, acknowledgement of my peers more than I need a specific belt. Uh, I want to. I want people to know that I'm good, and I want to feel that I'm good at what I'm doing, and see how how far I can take that. It's the same mindset in wrestling, um, but obviously that's where I got my black belts in both jiu-jitsu and uh, and karate, and uh, also where I've done my com- the competings, uh, the competitions I've done have mainly been for that club as well. So uh, it's it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. And- Having that mix of different things, the kicks, the strikes, the takedowns, also the ground fighting, that's always been such a good basis to bring into the wrestling ring. (laughs) Because everything is a little bit familiar. It's different, but it's familiar. It's always so funny, like, when we talk about this, and here's why I say it, because I love the transition from MMA to pro wrestling. Like, when people think of, like, Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler and Jessamyn Duke and, um, excuse me, Marina Shafir, and we've seen from the men's side of things with Ken Shamrock, Brock Lesnar, Dan the Beast Severn, and so many amazing talents in the mixed martial arts world. What I always loved and what always cracked me up about it, so Shayna Baszler, who's doing her thing in WWE, right, so crisp, so fluid, she has that discipline, much like yourself, and what I always loved was she was talking about a tweet where somebody said that her wrestling style was boring and you know you don't know how to wrestle i'm like if you actually look at it i'm actually taking down people and you know i'm actually wrestling like yeah no i don't know how to wrestle what i love about that too is we're so accustomed and the american style or the latin professional wrestling everybody wants to do a spot boom dive through the rope that's great for that awe and that high high octane aerial assault but there's just something about locking in a hold and just doing the christmas and like i said that systematic dissection joint manipulation it's stuff like that that a lot of people seem to feel like it's kind of lost in today's society so i love seeing that i love seeing what you do with the throw takedowns and whatnot because i respect that because it's very old school and not only is it very disciplined it's stuff that you could see in actual whether you're in a fight or whatever physical combat sport that really is kind of lost today because we're so focused on boom 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 dive it's not just you know just the normal takedowns and stuff which really can systematically dissect and isolate your opponent but i think i think uh, wrestling needs to be both it needs to have this extra sprinkle and i i like doing those things i mean i'm not gonna lie i, I love doing the flashy stuff uh, and i mean I'm, f- I'm fairly light so jumping on people has never been a problem for me I, <laughs> you know <laughs> I, I'm, I assume it's going to be fine, <laughs> usually is. <laughs> but, but having the basis of actual martial arts or, or really solid basis in, in wrestling also, uh, I think you need to have that to, it has to look like something. It can't just be, I mean, it's different, different schools, but I, in my opinion, wrestling is at its best when it actually really looks like it means something to the wrestlers. It has to be a fight. Um, so obviously, yes, add the flair, add add everything. Well, no flair, flair specifically doesn't have to be him, but uh, add add all the extra, uh, add the flips. Add, I mean, I love that stuff, but it has to be some something to bring it to to real place as well. Um, so, but wrestling should be a bit of everything, and I also I I love watching shows where the wrestlers are not the same when people are different to they wrestle different they they carry themselves different because that was makes a full show uh, not everyone in my opinion it's the best types of shows is when it's different types of matches it's different types of wrestlers because it's something for everyone and i think the audience especially the audience in the nordics 
prefer to have it that more than like a specific type of wrestling throughout the one or two hours. Um, but matter of taste, obviously. Of course. And I think for me, like my one of my first influences, I'll say this, like Jeff Hardy, it doesn't matter where he is. You'll always get over. He'll always get that crowd reaction. If you want to see him do a swanton off a ladder, you want to see him do the swanton. It's one of those things, too. Like, you can have a Jeff Hardy on a card. You can have a big man on a card. There's something about it that has that variety, like you mentioned, and that prowess, which is so great about professional wrestling. And what I also do love about it as well is, and I want to ask you about the MMA pro wrestling tie-in. How awesome is it to you? Like, I mentioned, like, those names like Ronda and Shayna. And in the States, we have a promotion called Invicta, which is run by Shannon Knapp, where a lot of women like Shayna Baszler came from. It's like that feeder to where we see, like, the UFC girls, like a Paige Van Zandt, who's in AEW now. How awesome is that to see? from women in mixed martial arts coming into pro wrestling and vice versa. You know, we get to see both of professional wrestlers and MMA mixing it up, whether it be in an octagon or whether it be a professional wrestling ring. How amazing is that just to see the evolution of how that relationship has grown? I think that's great. I mean, especially because I think in the martial arts community, um, not as much now maybe as it has been, but it's been a little bit pro wrestling. um, was a little bit looked down on for a while. for reasons being maybe how it was portrayed back in the days when it's uh, presented as sport more than entertainment. Uh, and the evolution of that is obviously a different uh, different thing. But I think the martial arts community kind of didn't exactly take wrestling seriously the same way as it is now, but uh, or, or the same way it does now, because now it's so much exchange. It's so much people crossing over and doing different things. And so it's like I said, it's similar, but it isn't the same, and it shouldn't be the same. Um, this is like comparing a banana to an apple. Both taste great, but it's not the same thing. It's, but it is fruit. Uh, and But mix it up and you have a gr- great fruit salad. What do I know? I mean, it kind of it, it kind of works, and it, they blend together very well. And you can you can do both if you're if you have that aspiration. You can you can use a lot of things. In martial arts, obviously in pro wrestling, but it's also I've learned a lot in pro wrestling that actually can carry over to, to the martial arts. Uh, maybe not so much in the technique basis for that, but in fluidity, in like learning to to feel and to uh, to read my opponent. I brought a lot from pro wrestling into martial arts when it comes to those things. So there is a trade-off uh, in different ways. Well, first and foremost, I'm going to say right now, you made me hungry with those bananas, man. Because oops, bananas. <laughs> I digress. But no, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I mean, there's apples to oranges there. You can have some bananas. It's like, it's the ice cream flavors. You can have some vanilla. You can have chocolate. Like, I don't just want vanilla all the time. Maybe I want some chocolate. Maybe I don't just want chocolate all the time. I want vanilla. You have to have that mix, and it's so imperative. And I, I think... Mean, if, okay. if, you ju- if you just like chocolate, that's fine, too. But, I mean, just acknowledge that other people might like the vanilla better. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I feel you. And I also look at it from a stance, too, as well. I'm going to make a pop culture reference here. When you're talking about your discipline, you're kind of like Hillary Swank in The Next Karate Kid. And yeah, I went to The Next Karate Kid style of things here because it's that very strong woman, that very empowered woman who just goes out there and kicks butt and take names. And what I also appreciate about that, too, is we see in movies like a Lara Croft Tomb Raider, if you will, just these badass women as these superheroes. Because I'm going to say right now, you kind of are, man. You are one of these women now who are going to inspire the next generation. And you have that complex, man, about you. We talk about that gravitational pull. That's got to make you feel good, man. You're just inspiring the next generations with your style. I really, really hope so. And I, I mean, I always uh, carry the hope that the next generation is, uh, is gonna, is gonna be a little bit better than us now. Uh, but I think, I think every, I hope, at least I hope that every generation kind of felt that at some point in life. I think we're doing decent. I think we can do better. And I think the next generation is going to take that to the next level because they're going to have even more experience um, to stand on uh, from future uh, from uh, from past generations. So yeah, and that comes that that goes with everything, not just uh, just in life in general, but also in professional wrestling, obviously. And looking at the women's uh, evolution and everything, I mean, I, I watch I watch a lot of wrestling. Um, nowadays since I since I discovered it so I have a lot to make up for and I watch different uh, eras and different kind of culture from wrestling um, and try to make up for lost time and I mean watching especially when it comes to women's wrestling uh, the, the the difference now to how it was just the beginning of 2000s is I mean it's enormous but then again go back 
and like a few a few decades more and you have like the japanese um, women and you have you actually had proper women that could wrestle even if there weren't that many even if it's in the us as well but something happened obviously and it's always going to be trends and things but seeing seeing from what it has been to what it is now it makes me very happy to want to be a pro wrestler in this era i have to be honest with that uh, and it also um it also makes me think that okay, we got this far now. Now let's bring it to the next level, and that's what the next generation I think is going to do. So if I can inspire a little bit of that, I'm going to be very grateful. And I think you most certainly will, first and foremost, with all due respect and love toward you, Miss Allison. But I think you will. And I, what I love about you too is I'm going to say this right now as someone who also got a late start in professional wrestling. So I started watching in 2002, and folks that know 2002, this is the year after WCW was purchased. There's no more ECW. The WWE is the only game in town before Impact Wrestling and Ring of Honor really took off. You have guys on the come up like John Cena, Randy Orton, Brock Lesnar, Batista, and to see where they've gone over 20 years, my goodness gracious. But like you talk about the women, you look at one back in the 90s like Bull Nakano, Alondra Blaze, formerly Medusa. You have Sherry Martell, sensational Sherry Martell. We have Jacqueline. We have Sable. We have Sonny. We have Molly Holly. And I'm going to say this right now. We got Jazz. We got Trish Stratus and a woman I'm going to compare you to because I look at you. You got the tats. You got the style. I'm going to say you're like a little Lita, if you will, because here comes Lita coming in here. Hurricane running women, hurricane running men doing the luchadora style. I got to say, looking at the tats, you remind me of a young little Lita over here. Oh, I mean, that's that's a very big shoes to fill not literally but she, figuratively extremely big shoes to fill well that's the Jeez, that... i mean that's that's uh she really was a trailblazer i mean there's been a there's been so many women that has been trailblazers for, for what is now but she's she might be one of the um, one of the biggest ones it, one of one of the wrestlers i actually knew was a wrestler before i, I actually knew knew about wrestling because she made she made an impact that was even heard up in the Nordics. Like, okay, this is someone famous and she's famous for this. Even if I hadn't seen her perform, that's something I knew. And, and you so. look at women that equate with, like, China, God rest her soul. And, I mean, you look at women like Beth Phoenix. The leader thing kind of came into fruition for a lot of people because at a time when WWE, you saw a lot of fitness models. And Trish Stratus, before she came into WWE, was a fitness model. You had Victoria, who also was a fitness model, and they... You know, boom, became two of the trailblazers in their own right. But Lita had that je ne sais quoi, if you will. Yes, I'm going to talk about that je ne sais quoi when it comes to the fact that, you know, you got this luchador style at the time, like we were mentioning the early 2000s. No one would ever see a woman do a hurricane rana, not just on her opponents, but on men. Like, it was something that made the Hardy Boys and Lita think special. The Hardys would do the work, and then here comes Lita, boom, twist, hurricane rana. You're like, oh, my God. Like, that stuff to see where that's evolved to, where we see so many aerial assaults that we were talking about, like your hurricane ranas, your splashes, your corkscrew planches, if you will, over the top. It's one of those things where it's like, God dang, man, this is something new. This is fresh. It's a variety. Like, you were talking about that sprinkle. Sprinkle it up. There you go. It's wonderful. And for me, I know you're talking about big shoes, but I also look at a woman like if you look at NXT 2.0, I kind of see a little Ivy Nile in you. She's doing her thing with the diamond mine, Roger Strong's group. Very has that stature about her, that Christmas. You got a little Ivy Nile to you. So you could see a lot of different varieties into your style, and it meshes well for yourself, Ms. Allison. Well, thank you so much. And I mean, it's uh, obviously this is an honor being compared to these women because I think that's women I watch. And think, wow, okay, I, can I aspire to be even a little bit as as good as this? <laughs> but I mean, it's it's always I'm I'm always I always I also have um, this um, I'm very I'm very skeptical about my own work. Usually, it takes a while for me to 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 actually even even watch my matches back. It it takes a while, and it's kind of like something I need to prepare myself to do. Uh, so because I always see I when I when I watch myself in the ring. I see every little detail, everything, every little thing, even if no one else is ever going to notice, I'm going to think, oh, okay, that's not good enough. Because I am a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to those things. I kind of learned now that I'm, I mean, starting to get a lot of uh, shows and I, I get more accustomed to it. Uh, I'm starting to learn that, okay, it is actually okay to not always be perfect. Uh, you, you can, it's, it's okay to see it, to know, okay, I can learn to do this better. Um, and uh, and evolve from that, which is obviously a good thing. But I don't have to take it so uh, so hard when it's not it's not as crisp as maybe I would have wanted it. 
because it doesn't at the end of the day is everyone happy with the show yes okay did did everything i mean what was the workmanship between the people in the ring good enough and up to par that that is the most important thing as well and the audience happy we're all good then i then i can i can nitpick at every little piece that i've specifically done i never i never nitpick anyone else though which is the thing because when i watch anyone else in the ring i was like wow i i want to do that why why am i not that good <laughs> so that's always the feeling that's always the struggle i think but uh, that's also what makes uh, i think that makes for a good um a good evolution on a personal basis. I think you need to have that drive to always perform a little bit better. Never never be satisfied. Right. That goes with any walk of life. And I think with yourself, too. First of all, I love that. And I can respect that, too, because every little nuance, every little thing that goes into your character and your overall art, art, artistry, if you will. You know what I'm saying? You like that. It's very meticulous. And boom, like we talk about the discipline factor. I mean, I'm going to use an Italian word here. Sometimes things may get fakakated. And for those that don't know what fakakated means, sometimes may get a little, things may get a little fucked up, if you will. You might mess up a little bit. But it's stuff like that where, you know, it happens. But also at the same time, as long as the people are up on their feet, they're, you're getting a reaction from the people, you're evoking that emotions, then you're doing your job. Exactly. And this is also, it's live. You don't get second chances. It's, uh, it's, it's one of those things. And I think every live performer, it doesn't matter what you actually do. It's, it's always, um, not everything is always going to be 100% to plan. Uh, but what you have to learn is adapt. And wrestlers in general, I think, is phenomenal had adapting because you really need to think quickly um if you can't think on your feet you can't wrestle um, it's almost like that evolution t-shirt when triple h batiste and randy orton came back in 2014 and they were going against the shield right it's the t-shirts the saying it's like you adapt or you perish which i'm going to say right now first of all great heel mannerisms right there and a great line for such great heels and impactful heels but if you look at it it's very, you know, it's very true. You either adapt with what you're doing or you perish and you fade away and you classify yourself as obsolete. But I digress. No, it's one of those things where it's like stuff like that really can motivate you. And I think in life, anything can motivate you or it can like, you know, dissipate you. So I think you're using it to your advantage where you're motivating yourself. You know yourself, you know your worth. And that is a great mindset to have. And I got to say, it's the spirit. It's right in here, man. You got it right in here. You got the heart. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've, I've come off shows and I felt like I should not be doing this. This is why, why am I why am I traveling all these miles and why am I why am I doing this? I'm just not good enough. But then again, you, you like I said, you you process and you think, okay, so this and this and this wasn't perfect. Was the was the whole okay? Yes, it, I mean, it was. It's fine. You don't have to kill yourself over this thing. Just uh, take a deep breath and then you work harder. And same with martial arts. I mean, sometimes you don't you never know what. You never know what you're gonna face uh, in a tournament, for example. Things can happen. I mean, you can you can have the best of plannings, you can have the best training camps ever, but you never know. And if if that is enough to not make you to not make you continue, then you didn't want it enough, and that's just the way it's gonna be, and that's your choice. Agreed. And what I love about you too is, and we're gonna talk about this here. So Regina Rosendahl, we got to talk about this with Finland, man, because her, oof, my dog, I'm going to say this right now. I've had her on the show. Such an amazing woman, such a very powerful woman, size, stature, what have you. She has that, oof, you know, doing. she's doing her thing with Aisha Raymond now. We got to talk about this, man, because you guys got to do your little thing thing there. You all have some great chemistry. And with your intensity and her intensity, it makes for a hell of a time. So I'm going to ask you about Regina Rosendahl, because my dog, that woman is doing a lot of amazing things in her own right. Yes. Oh, she definitely is. And I mean, ah, oh, I love her. <laughs> no, but she's, uh, she's amazing. Um, we, we got to know each other. She, she brought a lot of women in for a training camp that I was a part of in Finland. That's how, how I got to know her first. Uh, she's one of the, um, the veteran on the veterans on the women's side in, uh, in the Nordics. She's, uh, and she's absolutely amazing. She's, um, She's been through some tough times in wrestling and she's pushed through and she's uh, she's gotten where she is now. And uh, I have nothing but good things to say about her, honestly. So, um, uh, but yeah, we actually did finally get to go up in the ring together <laughs> a few weeks back. And uh, uh, I mean, that's also one of these things that we've both been waiting so long for this. Um, was it perfect? No, it wasn't. But 
ah, I'm so happy to have to have got that first match down, and I hope there's going to be so many more to come. Uh, we didn't have that much interaction in it because uh, it was it was a uh, it was a handicap match, kind of. It was um, it became a triple threat. It wasn't a um, and uh, obviously with uh, Regina and uh, Aisha uh, t- doing a bit of heelish uh, teaming up and so uh, so I actually didn't work so much with her and I kind of wish I w- we would have gotten that chance but we will eventually I'm sure um, she's uh, yeah she's just awesome in every way in wrestling in life and I wish her all the best always. <laughs> Same, and I'm going to say this right now with the most respect to the three of you, yourself, Regina, Aisha, y'all are three good ones in the professional wrestling game. Y'all are. Y'all are good people. And I, I think what's great about it, too, is as well, like you've gotten to see, I've seen your stuff with Stephanie Mays, which I'm going to talk, talk about Stephanie Mays here. My God, kick you and her with the kickboxer style. It's it's another one of those things. I'm like, my God, and this is why I love the strikes and kicks about professional wrestling, man. Just an impactful strike kick like we were talking about kickboxing and mixed martial arts on overall discipline. It's stuff like that where it's just like mouth, jaws drop, you know what I'm saying? Such an impactful maneuver. She's another one that really sticks out. So I had to give Stephanie Mays as well some credit because, my God, another one tearing it over there in the Europe scene. She's also, I mean, absolutely amazing. Uh, um and we had the pleasure to share the ring as well um, on her home territory. So um, yeah, that, that was that was so much fun. Uh, and we went at it pretty hard, pretty much uh, strong style on that one. <laughs> so um, for IWI um, promotion, and um, I think it's South Germany. I'm very bad with geography. <laughs> well, it was I, it was I, very I, warm and lovely. So I think it was South. <laughs> No, I can attest to that. I laugh because geography and math was never my strong points in school. So I'm okay with that. <laughs> I can respect that as well. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. No. And here's the thing too. Uh, yes, you're correct. South Germany. So it's it's one of those things too as well with the Stephanie Mays. And I've seen you do your stuff with Chantel Jordan, who's another amazing talent. Now, looking at what you get to do from the female side of things, kicking butt, taking names, magnifico. One of the other things I also have to put in there as well is the intergender side of things. I know you've been in there with a gentleman by the name of Demon Locke, and you've done a lot of intergender matches. Now, here's what I love about the intergender scene. Uh, AAA introduced us to a lot of women and men intergender wrestling, which we saw in Lucha Underground here in the States. Uh, we've seen a lot in professional wrestling in general. I mean, look at the comedy scene in the 80s. You had Andy Kaufman, God rest his soul, from Saturday Night Live. You know, intergender champion of the world, Jerry Lawler. <laughs> Like, that was the comedic side of things, but what I love about the evolution of intergender wrestling, it's just, it's great to see a lot of great, powerful women, such as yourself, and amazing men just mesh. And we've seen men and women train together in training schools and training classes and seminars. So I got to ask you about intergender wrestling and talk about, first of all, Demon Lock, great match. What are your thoughts on intergender wrestling? Because you've been in a lot of great intergender wrestling matches as well. I Yes, I've, I've had pleasure of working with so many good men as well in wrestling, and um Demolock, definitely. We had a had an um, ongoing feud in uh, Stockholm mm. uh, before COVID, uh, so it's been a while now. Um, but yeah, that was so so much fun. Um, I mean, we got some really great matches out of it, and as well, I mean, in Body Slam, had the Scandigraf tournament um, that I eventually won against Carlos Zamora in the final, um, and so, so many other. Uh, just the intergender wrestling in itself, I think it builds for very good storytelling. Um, I think, I mean, it's up to, up to any promotion how they want to portray, portray their product. I'm not saying everyone should have intergender wrestling. It might not be for what, what you want as a promoter for your specific promotion. But I think it is a, I, I, I think when you choose to have that as a part of it, it's so, it's so good stories you can tell. And it, it in wrestling, it's about the story. How many movies doesn't get to be blockbusters because they have a strong female lead kicking butt, as we're talking about? It is a thing that people want to see. And um, it is something that also works very well in wrestling. And it's, uh, it, you can work with that dynamic in so many different ways. Um, and I, I think, I think it's, it's, so, it's a lot of fun working with, uh, with women in the ring. It's a lot of fun working with men in the ring. I, I would, I mean, if it's a good, um, if it's a good worker, it's a good person, I honestly, it doesn't matter. I, I couldn't care less. I just want a good story out of it. And I want some, I, I want some good crowd interaction. I want the story to be there. Um, but it's, it's such a good uh, underdog dynamic, usually being a woman, especially 
woman of my size uh, maybe helps as well because I'm usually quite a bit smaller. Uh, but you you can work that in so many different ways, like the like the David versus Goliath kind of kind of dynamic going. And it's always something in the audience they just they just want to see you to get over that hurdle. And 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 take the ground. And I mean, I had had very recently a match with uh, Jamaica from Finland as well, like the current FCF champion. Um, and that's also so good to work with that kind of dynamic. When okay, here comes the champion from another country to fight for this first contender, for this contender chance for for the belt in in Stockholm or in the Nordics. Um, and they they the audience get behind that very easily. They. It's, it's something about that. You just want to see the underdog win and having the intergender match in that just adds another layer to it, I think. Agreed. And what I also, I'll, you mentioned something beautiful here, and I'm glad that you mentioned the storytelling as well, because we've been talking about story throughout this entire show and how important it is. Like, I remember as a kid, 2003, I was 11 years old, Miss Alice Inc. I remember Chris Jericho and Christian against Trish Stratus and Lita in the Battle of the Sexes, which was a big deal because they the story of it is us being scummy guys. And this is where sometimes a lot of you women have to keep us in check when it comes to the professional wrestling ring. Like, the whole bet was, you know, who could sleep with the other $1 Canadian, right? And then Trish and Lita just go out and molly whop Chris Jericho and Christian. You want to see Chris Jericho Christian, these slimy, these scuzzy guys, get their butts kicked. And that was made for the great story that went into the Armageddon 2003 pay-per-view. You want to see that happen. And here in the States... Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Sizzling Stan Styles. He runs the Intergender Bonanza, which is very big here in the States on the Northeast side of things. So you're seeing a lot of intergender shows coming into fruition, more intergender matches on cards. So it's stuff like that, whether it's storytelling and influential from the overall actions and words that go into it, it's wonderful to see intergender wrestling getting that shine. I reckon so as well. And this is the, just as tag team wrestling is a thing. Yep. It's uh, people want to see vari- variety in things. And I mean, sometimes you want to see two women fighting. Sometimes it should be two men. Sometimes it should be four people of whatever genders or non-specific genders as well. It, it, it just it should be different. Everything should have its thing and be specific from the other things. So it becomes a, a variety as a whole. And that's something the audience can enjoy for a longer time. And it's it's entertaining because you don't you don't want to listen to the same song over and over again, how, no matter how good it is. Uh, that's not going to be fun for two hours straight for most people. Yeah. Then again, we all, we all, we all get a little bit too, uh, <laughs> so, 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 I mean, I'm not saying there's no exceptions ever to that rule, but, <laughs> but generally speaking. Hey, I love me some Euro pop. And if I had to keep hearing Ace of Bases, don't turn around and I saw the sign. I love those songs, but I'd like to listen to more more stuff. You know what I'm saying? And I'll be honest with you. When you look at Sweden, like I was a kid, like I love the Muppets. Like I don't really always want to see the Swedish chef all the time. The hurting you, scaring you, burning Like I love that. But you know what I'm saying? Give me some more out of variety with the Muppets. You know what I'm saying? So it's one of those. Imagine th- living here. We hear the Muppet all the time. Oh! I mean. <laughs> Well, okay, maybe, maybe not quite. <laughs> so here's the thing, and I love that because all right, we'll talk about this here for a second because you want to we're bringing up the Muppets. All right, so here we go, Miss Allison. The Muppet movie, the Great Muppet Caper. We had the Muppets take Manhattan. We had the Muppets in space with Hulk Hogan included when he was a part of the NWO very briefly in WCW. <laughs> toward the end, like there were so many Muppet Muppet movies. It's like all right already. We get it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. they could have stopped at a certain point. Like, Muppets in Space was 99, and then I think they did another one years later. But I'm like, it's the Muppets. We know we're, we're going to get Kermit the Frog. We're, we're going to get Miss Piggy. We're going to get Gonzo. We're going to get all these people. We're going to get her new screen and burn it. We know what we're going to get with the Muppets. <laughs> That's also very true. <laughs> And I love the Muppets, but man, once we like got into like that role in like the mid two thousands when they came out, I'm like, all right, I know. Well, I, I'll I'll be honest with you. Here's what's always a stand time here in the states, like Christmas time, right? Christmas is beautiful. You're surrounded with the family. It's wonderful. The Muppets Christmas Carol is always played a lot, and because it's just well, there's so many different adaptations of a Christmas Carol, right? There's the Jim Carrey movie from Disney. There's this. There's that. There's so many different adaptations of it, but that is one that always gets played a lot. Is the Muppets Christmas Carol? So I mean, hey, if you have a Christmas tradition like that, right? I mean, in, in Sweden, it's actually, um, yeah, we do watch Donald Duck for Christmas for some reason, which is not a very Swedish thing to do. <laughs> but that's on at three o'clock still at television has been for my entire life and way ahead of that as well. 
So, Donald I don't Duck. know. M- Muppets is not that big of a stretch, to be fair. Ah, Donald Duck. Okay, I can appreciate that. No. All right, so all right, so I'll take it back here. So back in the day, <laughs> the Disney Channel, when I grew up in the 90s, what I always used to love is, like, at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning, like, in the early hours, right, they would play old school Zorro when Zorro was a TV show. Not the Mask of Zorro, the Legend of Zorro with Antonio Banderas. We're talking about the original Zorro TV show. And here's the, yeah, the odd lineup here, folks. Right after Zorro, we had the Mickey Mouse Club. So if you want to groove to some early Justin Timberlake, J.C. Cizé, Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, we have some Zorro then to kick button fighting, Zorro that action hero, and then we have some Mickey Mouse Club. Talk about a variety right there. That is variety. Agreed. <laughs> but, no, but as you were saying as well, I, th- I think uh, the problem with the Muppets, to be fair, I'm not counting Treasure Island in this because I still love the movie. I love it too. All right. <laughs> but, so, so except for that one, but I think the Muppets always stayed kind of the same. And I think to keep a product interesting, and this is very applicable to wrestling, it has to evolve. Characters have to evolve because you have a storyline that is within the show and within the match even. Everything is small storylines, but they come together and characters also need a storyline that they need to evolve. Because, uh, I mean, look, look at all the, the soap operas and those kind of dramas that goes on for, for ages and people still get invested in them because you want to see how the, how, how the stories around the characters actually evolve and intertwine. And wrestling is very much the same when it comes to the storytelling in the longer perspective. Right. And I mean, soap operas that still stand the test of time here in the States, like people talk about, you know, Bold and the Beautiful or General Hospital, like there's shows that have been on for like 30 years and they, they constantly evolve. But it's just like, my God, like stuff that stands the test of time. And I mean, for God's sake, before Ricky Martin was living La Vida Loca, he was on one of those soap operas with his long hair looking like Fabio, for God's sake. So, I mean, like if that's stuff, people that can resonate in people's minds, like, I mean, it sticks. You have to have something that sticks. You know what I'm saying? No, exactly. <laughs> you need to have something to lash on to, but you also need need to to see that it's going somewhere because a- any act is going to get stale eventually if, if it never changes oh, uh, the best act in the world is not going to be the best act in the world for 30 years straight um, well, look at Chris Jericho and The Undertaker I mean how they constantly evolve their characters over the years exactly and I mean so- some turns might have been better than others to be fair but they try different things and it's always, it's always led somewhere um, and I, th- I think that what makes the wrestling work and why why audience stay with it. Um, it's obviously very different on the indie scene because that's more of a live product. People don't follow it maybe the same way. But you always get these uh, these people that come on from, from every show in the territory. They go to everything and they want to see the same character build. So you have to have that, I think, as well to suck people in to actually invest in, in coming multiple times, not just one or two with their friends and have have a good time drink some beers and that's that's great as well there's always going to be that kind of crowd and i i love work with that kind of crowd they're usually very um they're usually very happy just to see something different and entertaining uh but i i like having the the long-term people there as well that they know the problem they know they know who's the bad guy they know who's the good guy they they can always and they they kind of get people going the right way as well so it's, it's good having the combination i think Mixing the lifelong fans, the long-term fans with the newcomers. It, it's a nice mix. And we also we all get to learn together and we get to gel together. And that's what makes being a wrestling fan amazing and just enjoying the craft that it is. And I'm going to say this right now. we got to talk about your tattoos here for a second as well. This is what I have to get into. Because first and foremost, tattoos, it gives you that edge. It gives you that nice little mix. Uh, for me, two of my favorite tattoos on my body is uh, I have a strength tattoo and I have two uh, tattoos dedicated to my grandparents, which, again, very meaningful. And I think stuff like that is the body is the canvas and you get to really apply and tell your story through your body and your artwork on your body. And you're kind of like the illustrated man, if you will. For those who remember that book from back in the day, I'm taking it back to my senior year in English class, my own and me. But no, I digress. It's one of those things where tattoos are very symbolic and it's very, you know, it's very formidable with an imagery, within magazines, what have you. So I got to ask you, Miss Alice Inc., Inc., pun intended, which by the way, <laughs> uh, Tattoos, man. How did you, when did you first get your first tattoo? Talk about the tattoos that you have that are very symbolic to you. I had to ask you about the tattoos because, I mean, apropos with the ink, but I got to say, you got a nice tattoo. I got to admire the ink. Thank you so much. Uh, no, I had my first one done when I was 17, hmm? which is a little bit too early, maybe, for, uh, I hope my parents aren't watching this. <laughs> but no, but it, it, 
I, I had a, an interest for tattoos from uh, from quite an early age, uh, fascination with the art form. Um, so I, I was really, really wanting to get my first one as quickly as I possibly could. So I got it at 17. And then I had a few um, a few ones after that as well, quite quickly done. Um, the the tattoo era hadn't exactly bloomed bloomed yet in Sweden. It was still a lot of like you know you went to a tattoo shop, they had their books uh, with you know the the standard tattoo things that they could do. Um, all the Miami Ink and all of those shows hadn't really started airing here yet, so um, it hadn't really been like the custom tattoo idea wasn't wasn't really that big. So what I did when I um, when I wanted to start getting tattoos, I did my own drawings. Uh, it's like, and I always had a fascination with the uh, fantasy and with those kind of stories, and uh, always read Tolkien. And I, I I'm a huge fan of uh, Terry Pratchett and those kind of like worlds and uh, everything around it. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a lot of dragons. That was my that was my idea as a 17 year old. Um, so I started making, I, and I did a few tattoos with the dragons, um, and they did not age well because, you know, you went to a cheap studio somewhere, you didn't actually understand that. I mean, it is more more of a quality product than quantity, maybe. Uh, so, so I did a few tattoos quite quickly, but uh, they have not exactly stand the test of time. I have some of them incorporated though in the artwork I have now, because uh, I. Um, I took a break from tattooing um, early twenties. Twenties uh, uh, didn't do anything. I didn't plan for anything, and then I picked it up again and decided I'm going to do a full bodysuit. I'm going to I'm going to see what I can do with the ones I have. That's going to be wonky because of body changes as well in those ages. Um, I didn't train much uh, as a teenager. Or I did train, but I didn't train strength. So my body shape uh, shape changed a lot as well. Um, so I had to kind of make up for that and fix the old ones, but I also wanted, okay, I want, I want the unit. I want like the, the Yakuza style bodysuit, like the Irizumi. Um, and also it mirrored my, my interest for Japanese culture that peaked as well. And like, I got into all of those things, started reading up on like Japanese, uh, stories and, uh, legends and also Chinese, uh, legends as well. And like started to get very interested in that kind of culture. So. So a lot of the tattoos I have is that kind of, those kind of um, symbolics. Uh, I have, for example, a, a baku on uh, one of my legs that is a demon from Japan that eat nightmares. Uh, it's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> it, look, it looks like a um, mix between a lion and an elephant, kind of. Um, but it's um, a, a lot of a lot of Japanese demons. I have some. Um, I have the Monkey King as well on my ribs from from Chinese culture, so um, but I, I I really do love that imagery and I love the, um, those those kind of stories. There's also long time storytelling because uh, I mean these are legends that's been kept alive and you know from the weirdest ideas sometimes, but it's, it's still engulfed into the culture in in such a amazing way. Uh, I mean the the yokai culture in japan or the culture but the, the yokai uh, idea in japan like having all these house demons for different things i think is absolutely brilliant and it's very similar as well to a lot of things in swedish culture if you look if you look back long enough for like when you have the house gnomes doing different things and so on so um i think i think that's kind of you humanity's way of explaining things just that in uh, a lot of um especially Japan, I'm going to say especially because that's what I know most about. That might not be correct. Um, but a lot of the, the idea of there being entities or there being demons doing things in everyday lives kind of like it still kept going a lot longer, I think. Uh, people like, oh, wait a second, I'm going to have a demon doing this now. And that became a thing. And I think it's absolutely amazing. You have the book of... Um, I think it's Book of Thousand Demons, I think it might be translated to, uh, with all these different designs and stuff. And I also, like some of the tattoos I have is very, um, have have a lot of resemblance to that, or is like inspired by it, that art style, because I think it's, it's a bit grotesque, but it's not, I mean, it's, it's on the on the verge to being too weird, but not quite. And I, I, I love the way of drawing and I love the way of art style. I, I'm not talented enough to do it myself, uh, 
But I mean, I, I can stand for hours and watch those kind of like uh, cartoony drawings, but the small details of it, like, uh, oh, why does why does that person or th why does that thing have that thing in his claw? And why is the claw turned that way? And how does that work? And how does a joint actually? I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm weird, but I think it's fascinating. No, I, I, I agree with you. I'm fascinated by listening talk about this i appreciate that stuff and i it's little nuances like we mentioned before and just that integral details so to speak and i'll be honest with you right now don't even feel bad you know getting it early at 17 i got mine straight out of high school when i was around 17 18 too my father had no idea so he eventually saw it well that went over well but no i, so, I agree with you no because so, there, i'll be honest with you my mom was fine with it because i wanted to get a dedication on my grandfather but my dad's like what are you doing because he was thinking it of because there's a lot of people, I'll say it in the States, that, you know, if, you, if you're trying to get a job and they see the which it shouldn't matter, but there's certain corporations and organizations that have frowned upon on the inkage, if you will. But, you know, it is what it is. So I understood it. But I'm like, my dad kind of got accustomed to it because it's very addicting. Like you were talking about the addiction. Then it like it stops for a period and you take a break, but then it'll pick up eventually, you know. So I hear you. And I also... Yeah. I also like the fact as well, like you're talking about the intricacies and the details. It's stuff like that where like we were talking about, like you see in an inked magazine or you see an ink master in its 80 seasons. I know I'm, I'm overzealous and exaggerating, but there's so many of those goddamn ink master shows. <laughs> and you have Miami Ink and you have all these shows that have that influx and show the artistry and what really goes into tattooing. And I'll be honest with you, I can't draw a stick figure either. So watching is very fascinating, so I can't draw either. But I appreciate that because it makes you smile. It's like once you go Go into like a tattoo studio or a tattoo, you know, parlor. It's one of those things where you're surrounded by so many images. It's like, you know what I'm saying? You want to know and you want to feel out. So it's put the feelers, if you will, of what you want to get and put out your on your body. Exactly. And I mean, I, I'm, I've said now that I'm I'm done um, with what I have. I kind of like I have framed out the bodysuit that I was planning to. I don't have that much space left, but I'm not, I'm not completely covered. Uh, so but we'll see. We'll see how long that lasts. Uh, the, ta the tattoo artist that's done uh, all my, I say recent work, but that would be 10 plus years anyway. So <laughs> it's not that recent. It's taken a while to get where I am now. But, um, he's actually retired from tattooing for the time being, at least. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll see if uh, if my tattooing era ends with him or if I'm going to continue. Uh, he might actually pop back and do something eventually as well. We'll see. I was going to say, do you have any new more like tattoo ideas and, and what you want to get in particular? Or is it just like, you know what, <laughs> just about, what are you thinking? I mean, I always have ideas. <laughs> uh, Fair enough. There's always an idea somewhere. <laughs> but I mean, that's that's been so great with him because I mean, I've, I've gone to him so long. Uh, he's done uh, he's done so much work. We spent so many hours together just talking bullshit and just having fun while obviously me being in pain and he him not but that's fine that's part of it <laughs> uh, but I mean it eventually got to the point where I, I could just walk in and it's like I had times set up because um, okay we want to progress we want to make this bodysuit happen basically to set up a couple of times uh, with a few weeks or a month in between uh, for periods of times uh, to get some progress, making all, you know, the, sh the shading and everything. Everything is, is not done in just one day, obviously. Um, we got to the point, like, oh, wait, what are we doing today? It's like, I don't know. Oh, you don't know either. Well, okay, let's just figure something out. <laughs> what do you want to draw today? <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Do you want to do a frog? Yeah, let's do a frog. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we, had, we had a lot of, uh, but everything's turned out great. And he's, he's, um, he's an awesome artist. So whatever he does um, now, I hope it's, I mean, I'm assuming it's going to be just as great. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. He's, um, we, had, we had a lot of fun times together, though, figuring out what the hell we we're actually doing with the tattoos. Because, you know, uh, changing things, like moving things around, put, taking out that, uh, a regular ballpoint pen, like starting to like drawing. Like, nah, I'm, I'm going to do this instead now. You okay with that? Yeah, go for it. As long as it's not like a tattoo nightmares episode where they get <laughs> regretful tattoos. Oh my god, and those cover ups, my goodness gracious. Oh, those yeah. Oh. Well, I will say nope. this. No, it's it's funny because it's like you watch those shows, and I apologize for cutting you off there, but it's like you watch those shows and it's just like First of all, most of these people are intoxicated when they get this stuff done. And it's just like, what in the world are you thinking? Because I think the number one rule in tattooing is like, you don't get a person's name on you. Because number one, you don't know how long you're going to be with that person. Number two, 
come on now, that's just common sense. Yeah, I mean, no, this is it's just um, it is the thing. So intoxication helps with those kind of decisions. Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think anyone should get tattooed ever uh, under the influence because it's kind of like you shouldn't drive under the influence. You shouldn't get tattooed either. It's just a bad idea. <laughs> but I mean, then then again, I mean, sometimes you just have this idea, and you th- in your head is so much better than you think it is. And I think because uh, I've had ideas, some some tattoos have been very much having a clear idea of what I wanted to do, but I always had the process of like talking to the artist and see, okay how do we need to do this to make it work? Because at the end of the day, he's the expert. I'm not. But I, I have, I've spent so many hours in tattoo studios. I've heard other people having a very different idea of how things will be done best. Uh, I even sat uh, beside a couple once with a, with a girlfriend who was not being tattooed, was micromanaging the tattoo artist work on her boyfriend. I was like, mm-hmm. did that turn out great? No, it did not because it didn't make any sense for the medium used because it's skin it's not it's not paper it's skin mm-hmm. and the body moves in different ways i mean it's, it's not a flat surface obviously uh, i'll be honest with you and then it's funny because i thought i was going to be one of those guys that was going to be on the tattoo nightmare so i had an artist great artist right so i have on my arm it says the word strength now i have a ring that has strength it has a nice little scripture on it, it means the strength to get through anything in life you know the strength to do whatever you want to do it's strength in your overall abilities right it's very meaningful with the word right so it's a very meaningful piece so i got it on my arm and when he was doing the stencil, lucky I caught it. He didn't spell strength, S-T-R-E-N-G-T-H. He forgot the G. So I almost had strength on my arm. And I'm like, and I, I told him this. Oh. I said to him, I said, you forgot the G. And he goes, good eye. And I'm like, you almost got this on my body, man. I mean, I imagine that happens so often, though. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm very scared of getting texts in general. Uh, it's one thing in languages you can read, but so many p- people getting it in um, in languages they can't read. Like, I mean, classic Chinese um, kanji and those kind of stuff. Um, if you're not, if you can't read it, you probably shouldn't put it on your body because you're not, you don't actually know what it says. Right. Uh, or at least have it fact checked by someone who does. I mean, that's fair enough. But I, I, I've always been too scared to do anything like that. It's like, no, if if I if I not myself can be absolutely 100 percent sure is right i will not put it on my body <laughs> it's like we're the millers you know what i'm saying no regrets you don't have any regrets <laughs> not even one letter that's what <laughs> like no regrets it's where the millers all over again yes <laughs> it's so easily done as well i mean i'm not great at spelling so <laughs> I, I can relate to the tattoo artist that's yeah, done like a thousand tattoos that week and like okay you're going to do a quick one and it's just going to be this word and then you misspell it somewhere or you type it wrong or it becomes another word because you know it didn't check the spell I mean the spell check uh, so I mean it's uh, I, I can relate to that as well <laughs> it's a word cassette I think yep hey. uh, it, it's, uh, it's a client's uh, the client should check as well to be safe and it's good you did <laughs> well spotted I was about but to yeah he, he could have said as well it's like oh shit fuck I- yeah, Sorry. he realized it after I said it, and I'm just like, I, I, here's the thing, I love that guy, that dude, that dude is my dude, but I'm like, I would have been really mad if I would have had strength on there, you know what I'm saying, I could have passed it off and said, you know, this is what I say, strength, they call, call it very, like, different vibes with it, you know what I'm saying, but a little gangster vibe to it, but I'm like, nah, I could even pass it off, my paley white boy skin, eh-eh. but I digress. <laughs> So, and that's the thing, and one last thing I'll say if, as far as tattoo goes before we wrap this thing thing up. Okay, so if you were a member of a boy band back in the 90s, they always had that doggone barbed wire tattoo. Now, I never understood why, and a lot of people got this, I never understood why everybody thought that was so cool to get like a barbed wire tattoo on you. Yeah. And then you grow older and you look, you're like, this is effing ridiculous. This is really fucking ridiculous. You know, the, the trend of the barbed wire tattoo, right? <laughs> I know. And I do have an old one with barbed wire, so I can't really say anything. <laughs> You do okay, all right. <laughs> but, no, uh, no, 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 that's fine. I, I, yeah, it's uh, obviously one of my old ones that is incorporated into the rest. You can't, you can barely see it now because it goes, um, right, it's just other things around it, but yeah, been there, done that. <laughs> Barbed wire cats, man. Good lord, mm-hmm. I was about to say. No. 
No, I get it. I'm, I'll, here's well, here's the thing that that's interesting about it. If you guys want to watch some old Backstreet Boys videos, specifically, I want it that way, or one of those where they actually have like their low sleeve. You can see some barbed wire tattoos. Or put on a 98 Degrees video, and uh, here's what I love. And I love Jeff Timmons. And 98 Degrees is the 90s pop right there. Them Backstreet Boys in sync, top three, right for 90s pop, right? So <laughs> Jeff Timmons, who founded 98 Degrees, along you know Nick Lachey. Drew Lachey and, and Justin, whatever his name was, Jeffries, I think it was. So they, so he okay. had, right. So, it, it's been a, it's been a long time. It's only been 20 <laughs> years since they've been around. So he, Jeff Timmons actually had a tattoo that said 98 degrees on it, like a logo of it, which I can respect because it's dedication to his group and the overall foundation of how it came together. I can respect that. But there was a couple of them. And I think Jeff Timmons himself had it. And I'm looking at him like, oh God. It's the boy band thing, man. Every boy band or anybody in general, they have the barbed wire tattoo. I mean, in, I think, I yeah, think at least in Stockholm. I don't know if I can say Sweden in general on this one, but in Stockholm for a while, you can see a lot of people doing their first tattoo, at least the first visual one. Uh, like, not not the barbed wire thing around the arm, but, you know, the, um, the Indian uh, feathers going yes. down, like... Uh, that was so common. You can, you can almost like you sit on one of the more busy streets in in Stockholm. It's like just count them. And you can you know, it was a fun drinking game. Uh, <laughs> but it, it was that bad for a while. I did not think that. But yeah, that was that was the one I think that hit the, hit the most here. For I don't know why, to be honest. Uh, but it was definitely a thing, and obviously the the tribal in the neck and everything with that, obviously as well, uh, during the nineties. So, <laughs> <laughs> what times, man? But I got to say, it's a lot of good times and it's a lot of memorable times, and these are the memories and memories that we create and are yet to be created. So I think that's wonderful, and that's what makes life so amazing. And speaking of amazing, you, my friend, with your internal and external beauty and your overall craft that you apply, you're doing a lot of great things. And I'm going to say right now, I wish you nothing but continued success. Thank you, and the same to you. And I'm so, so, so much fun talking to you. Uh, thank you for having me on the podcast. Very welcome. I'm going to say the overture is here, man. We got to do a round two in the future. I'm, I'm putting out the overture to you. We'll definitely, I'll definitely get you back. Definitely, I, I would love that. So, just, uh, yeah, we'll let it sit for a bit, and then uh, I would love to have an encore. A couple final things here. Well, first and foremost, being a professional wrestler that you are, obtaining that knowledge that you have, what advice would you give to a lot of the young towns coming in, female, male, what have you? What advice do you have, man? Because, again, you're a book of knowledge. You're learning. You're constantly learning each and every day in professional wrestling. What advice would you give to the up-and-comers? Oh, I would say um, know your worth uh, as a wrestler and as a person. Uh, don't take shit but never keep never stop pushing always try to be better uh always try to be the best you can and want to be because uh, um, i i think um in the wrestling business as it has been and and still is to a point um you have to you have to th there is this kind of how do i put this uh there there is this kind of initiation thing still going on and like you know, you're a rookie. You uh, obviously coming from martial arts background. It should be a it should be a hierarchy for things. I do think that is healthy. Uh, you can learn from the from the people coming before you, but you should always be respected back. Um, and you should should respect goes both ways. Uh, so know your worth with that specifically. You should be respected as a as a as a rookie or as a as a veteran, and uh, you can both learn from each other. I think. Um, but also when you when you go out and like if you start going to different promotions, touring, don't doubt yourself. Be the best you can be, because that's always that's that's what people are hiring. That's what people are paying the tickets to see. That's that's you being the best you can be. So always try to be that. Um, Beautifully said, eloquently said. I think you <laughs> hit the nail right there, man. That's it's so true. It's so true. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, you're very welcome. I'm smiling just thinking that because I, I don't think you could say it any better. And I, I think in this day and age, especially, you know, with everything that's going on with mental health, which is very important, I think a lot of people need to hear that because there are a lot of lives that are worth it. Every life is worth it. And there's a lot of things that a lot of people want to do, but they can be very apprehensive of it. So just go out there and do it. Do the damn thing, if you will. Put it bluntly, 
four words do the damn thing. Exactly. I mean, I have, um, like, I was talking about my cousin earlier and um, him yeah. and his brother has a, um, has a saying, nobody remembers a chicken. Um, so, <laughs> so don't be a chicken, go out and do what you want to do. <laughs> I am going to use that now. Nobody remembers a chicken. I like that, man. Take it back I to love the- that as well. That is so, okay, that's very fitting. You know what I'm saying? It, it's almost like Back to the Future. You know, nobody calls me chicken. Michael J. Fox, you know, friggin' Butthead and Biff will go there. There you go. Me, right? <laughs> hey. But no, I think that's very apropos. Don't be a chicken. Know your worth. Do the damn thing. We'll be here all day. Eloquently said, my friend. Now, <laughs> before we close this out, Miss Alice Inc., forms of social media there's facebook there's twitter there's instagram hell we even got a little tiktok now doing the thing thing now that's the big trend let us know where we can find you on all forms of social media the floor is yours i am uh, most active on my instagram um you can find me as alice uh, underscore inc underscore uh but i'm also on facebook as alice inc and on um, twitter as inc alice so and i'm not on tiktok yet I'll I'll work on that one. <laughs> okay, well, all right. Well, we're going to say this because a lot of people have mixed feelings about the old tickety tack, or as I like to call it, the upgraded version of Vine. Because it is, people. <laughs> all right, it's what it is. Don't act like you don't know that it's some upgraded version of Vine. Hell, we had Tout back in the day, and that failed miserably for WWE, and it was horrible for those who remember Tout. So I digress. It's one of those <laughs> things where it's the new trend right now. It's the TikTok. Mind you, there is more to just dancing and doing stupid ass challenges on that damn thing. But I understand it why other people, why people do not do it, because it can be very, you know, monotonous, if you will, mostly like all so- forms of social media. But we have to have it in this day and age to promote. So there's some positivity to each and every form of social media. So, yeah. And yes, check out her Instagram, by the way, because my God, woman, beautiful imagery, beautiful promo videos and all that. I saw you doing your thing. Wrestle Island Rumble entrant. Is that correct, man? You're doing your thing over yes. there. Rumble? All that right. It's very true. I'm going back second time to Wrestle Island. It's uh, yeah. I mean, a 30 man rumble. So that's going to be a blast. Oh, my goodness. Yes, I'm very excited. And I hope you win. I'm going to say that right now. I hope you win. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say right now as well, woman, you're talking about if you ever come states out, I'll buy a ticket, I'll come see you. I definitely want to be in the crowd uh, when you come in the states. Well, I will definitely be posting that everywhere if that happens. So yeah. fingers crossed. <laughs> Across. I know it will happen. I believe in you. So before we do close this out, the our links to the social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everybody can find Alice will be below this audio here and on my YouTube channel. But I will say this, my final words, as I always say, beauty, strength, and dominance are three key elements to make women the work of art that they are. And Miss Alice Inc., I include you in those sentiments. Thank you so much for your time. And give one final, you're very welcome. Give one final shout out to the fans that have been supporting you since day one. Please go ahead. I would not be where I am if I did not get the support. And I, um, you're amazing. Don't forget that. There would no, there would be no show without fans. There would be no wrestlers without fans. Um, so we talk about know your worth. Know your worth as an audience. Because you're the, you're the third person in the ring, always. You're needed for, for the entire show. Wrestling would be nothing if it weren't for the people watching. Ah, beautifully said. For Alice Inc., my name is Mike Larkin. Check her out, support professional wrestling, and I'll talk to you in the next edition of On the Mic with Mike. Thank you so much, Alice. <laughs> Thank you for having me. You